So, okay, let's head on to Hebrews uh, verses 12 through, 12 through 19. Um, and we'll finish up chapter 3. <coughs> Excuse me, we've got plenty of time. Before we get going, uh, were there any questions from Hebrews over the past couple weeks? Anything we talked about? Didn't make sense? Something you didn't understand? Something you were reading on your own and you thought, huh, I wonder what's going on there? Anything? I'm going to assume that's a no. We're passing on. I don't know. Well, you lost your chance. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 says, oh, well, before that, let me uh, just remind you, if you, in case you don't remember, maybe you weren't here last week, we were looking at the idea of don't harden your hearts, not as non-believers, but as Christians, don't harden your hearts. Um, the book of Hebrews was written to Christians, primarily talking about today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart, not talking about people in the world. So very, very important there. So moving on to verse 12. Watch out, brothers and sisters, so that there won't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. So the first thing I want to point out from this uh, is that he specifically tells this audience, watch out. He doesn't just say, hey, some people can follow. He's like, watch out, <laughs> uh, so that there won't be any of you. Th that, the, real, the idea here is that there is a real danger. It can happen to anyone. Anybody can be misled. Anybody can let the hardness of sin into their heart. Anybody. It doesn't matter if they're a pastor or just somebody who's been going to church their whole life. It, it doesn't matter. Anybody can become hardened. Anybody. Um, I know there's been times in my, th in my life where I thought, nope, it'll never happen to me. And then it happened to me. And I saw other people, and I thought, ah, it'll never happen to them. And then it happened to them. It happens to anybody. When we get this idea, and we all do it, that, that, that's, that's something that I'll, I've never struggled with and I never will. I'm not the kind of person that would cheat. I'm not the kind of person that would look at that stuff on the Internet. I'm not the kind of person that would – we all are. <laughs> we have an inclination to evil. <laughs> we have a draw to it. It's just who we are, <laughs> and uh, it's something that we always have the temptation with. And if you notice here, it says there, it won't be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. That turns away from the living God. And the thing is, evil, unbelieving hearts turn away. Evil unbelieving hearts, they lead you away. That's, 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 what, that's, what the, that's what they do. You could say it like this. You choose at first, and then it chooses for you. At first, you choose your actions, but in time, your actions eventually choose you. Um, I think the greatest example that we have of this is Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. Everybody talks about the way that it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And they always say, well, that's a very immoral thing for God to do. How, how can he possibly judge someone if he was the one who made them do it? Well, if you back up into the story, it says, first, Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then it says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. See, at first, it was Pharaoh's decision. He decided to do that. And then when you decide to do that, starts making the choice for you, and your, your evil heart leads you astray. You make the decision based off of what you've been doing. When a big decision comes up in your life, your decision will be, will be based on how you have responded over the past three or four years, or maybe even longer. It's your series of choices that make you. It's, it's one of those things that leads up. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yes, yes. It, it starts off like that. It starts off with, okay, what are you going to do? And you're going to have, you know, the battle of your conscience and stuff. You're going to think, what do I really want to do? Do I really want to do that? Eh, it's kind of hard. You're going to have to make some decisions, and you're going to make decisions based off of whatever you believe. And then that, that action, that choice, is going to make a habit. This is now what I do now. Um, after that habit is formed, th it continues into where it becomes a lifestyle. This is how I live now. And now that I have this lifestyle, now, it's, now it changes my belief. Maybe at first I believed God is faithful, God is good. But then I made some choices that I knew were wrong. Those made, became habits, became lifestyle. And now my belief has changed. God's not really all that good. I mean, he, he, ki I mean, he kind of is, you know, and he did the whole cross thing. But he doesn't really care for me individually. See what I mean? And now my sin is defining me, and it's changing the way I think. See, at first we are free from that. And we have kind of we, we choose our beliefs, but then in time our beliefs choose us based on our action. And so what you have is you have people say, "I'm a Christian, I'm a believer," 
But what happens is they get harder and harder towards God, and they live life on their terms, but they follow this, their golden star. I still feel good. Basically, I feel like I'm right. So if I feel good about this, it must be good. So I'm not doing anything wrong. So then they'll keep staying the course. And then if you say, hey, you know, you're sinning, well, who are you to judge me? I, I'm living by my truth, and, and I, I feel good about this. See what I mean? And, and you, you start being deceived in your own mind. Not so much an outside force is deceiving you, you're deceiving yourself. Does that kind of make sense? And it's one of those things that kind of builds. You could say this a different way. Choice becomes belief. And that's the easiest way I can think of to say it. Um, I, I, something my dad used to always say growing up, and I, well, I not just growing up, but in the church, and I just stuck with me. I think that it's totally on, on, on target. The same pride that gets you into sin will be the same pride that, keep, that keeps you there. So you're going to make a decision, be arrogant about something. You, you're, yeah, I can't be corrected. And you're going to just, okay, well, no. And then you're going to gossip because, you know, they did the wrong thing first, so it's okay what I'm doing. And you're going to get your feelings all wrapped up into it. So now you can't see clearly because it's an emotional thing. And so you keep staying with that course over and over again. And then, even if you can be reasoned with, you won't be reasoned with. Because your pride will keep you in that sin. And your pride starts to rule you. Now, our culture kind of celebrates pride nowadays, but um, the Bible still warns very strongly about what a prideful heart can do. Um, it's a very bad place to be in. So, uh, and 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 in, in this point, as a Christian, not as the part of the world, as a Christian, when you get to this point, you refuse to change. It doesn't matter who says what; you refuse to change. Um, it's a very dangerous place to be in, and we'll get to that later on in Hebrews. Where, why he why Hebrews says it's a very dangerous place to be in, but that's for chapter six. We'll just kind of hold back on that. And just remember that we're going to go there. Um, and so what typically what we do is we say something along the lines of this. Well, I feel like I'm doing pretty good. I feel like I'm not very prideful. I feel like I don't gossip. I feel like I'm, I'm in a good place. But the thing is, feelings can't really decide truth. You can't base where you are by how you feel about where you are. You have to base it on some kind of evidence. And so that takes us back to what Jesus said. What is your fruit? You can tell the tree by the fruit. You know, are you, are, are you, are you producing rotten things or are you producing good things and that kind of summarizes i think all the all that we can really go here um but as we're looking at hebrews and i want you to remember this he's talking to christians who are leaving who are considering leaving christianity to go back to judaism these are jews that got saved they want to go back and one thing you see is that if god is no longer enough his grace his desires it no longer moves you you no longer you no longer move by that. You no longer care about God's purpose. If God isn't enough, nothing someone else says will be. There's a lot of times when, when people see somebody causes a church split or they get involved with with some some you know great big sin or something like that, and they always say, "Oh, if I just say the right thing, if I still be their friends, I can win them back." No, no, that's just simply not true. The Bible even warns about this. Stay away from these kinds of people. It says. And so then we say, no, no, I can still change them. <laughs> and it's our arrogance that gets us there because, no, you can't. If God is not enough for the person, whatever you say or do will not be enough for the person. And uh, so the only way to really get aw get away from that is to kind of get yourself into a growth mindset where you are in a constant place of challenging yourself, challenging your beliefs, moving forward. Hebrews 3.13 moves on. But encourage each other daily while it is still called today so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. Now, if you noticed... He just gave us another benefit of the church meeting together. And that's that the answer to an evil heart, at least in part, is meeting with the church. See, if you go back to verse 12, it said, Unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, going straight into verse 13, but encourage each other, but instead of an evil and believing heart, encourage each other daily while it is still called today so that none of you is hardened by sin's deception. That the answer to that evil heart is the uh, church meeting together. So here's the thing about, about deception and, 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 and that, and I want you to take this to the bank because this inevitably happens to every single one of us, okay? Just remember this. Especially as we're going through the book of Hebrews, really remember this because the people of Hebrews, they are convinced that they are not being deceived. Okay, so just remember this. 
and this is kind of how it works all around the world. Nobody thinks they can be deceived. Nobody thinks they are deceived. That's how deception works. If people knew that they were being deceived, there wouldn't have been a Jonestown. The whole idea of deception and cults and the occult is that people don't know that they're being deceived. And so in each of our heads, because we all have a ginormous hubris, we all say something along the lines of this. No, that couldn't happen to me. I couldn't be deceived. Maybe you already right now are being deceived. It's possible. It's very possible. And especially in our world today, it's, it's incredibly easy. You read something in a book and you think, that sounds right. It really reverberates in me. Uh, I think it really, really hit me here. That means it must be good. So you get to verse 14. For we have become participants in Christ if we hold firmly until the end of the reality that we had at the start. So here's kind of the idea of don't lose heart, okay? And we looked at this last week. It's not getting saved that makes you a Christian. It's finishing the race. Jesus told us the parable about the seed that started to grow but then got choked out. The same thing can happen to us. It's not how we started the race. It's how we end the race. Th- think about this. Think of all the different presidents or, or leaders or whatever. And when you think of them, remember that you remember best the way they ended, not the way they started. You know what I mean? When you think back on the different, on the different people, think about the people, who, mentors that died or, or relationships that ended. You always remember how it ended, right? You remember how... Uh, how, how You don't remember all the bad stuff. (laughs) You remember the way it ended. You remember this. Well, if you think about the different... uh, Here's a good example. Think about the different pastors that you know of that were caught and publicized on the news with, you know, that kind of a relationship. You know what I'm saying. Uh, That's all you remember. There, there's a fan, fantastic Christian apologist. His name was Ravi Zacharias. He wrote so many fantastic books, had a lot of great things to say. But after he died, it came out that he was involved in many sexual relationships that were very, very bad. Now, he still wrote some very good books, but we don't really see that anymore, do we? We see Ravi Zacharias was living a double life. See what I mean? Uh, you think about Billy Graham. Think about all these different people that you know. It's the way something ends that you remember, not, not the way it starts. For we have become participants in Christ if we hold firmly until the end the reality that we had at the start. Um, it's not about starting, it's about finishing. And if you notice here, he says we have become parta- participants in Christ. Another translation says partakers. The idea of this is we're part of his body. I know it's kind of a little bit, if you're not used to the terminology here, it's just kind of a little bit confusing, but it's the basic of it. Um, so in, in, in these passages, in these verses, we can see that one of the big things is talking about is growing in the faith. Don't become complacent. Um, there's always going to be a reason, you know, not to worship, not to serve God, not to trust God, not to obey God. You get into a situ- certain situation, you have to trust him in a way you've never had before. There's always going to be that reason. But here's the thing. Do it anyways, and that's what defines the real thing. Worship isn't worship when you feel like worshiping. Worship is worship when you don't want to sing the songs, you don't want to pour your heart heart out to God, you don't want to seek Him, and you do it anyways. That's what makes worship, worship. Service isn't service when, hey, I I love doing this, I feel like doing this all the time. It's service when you don't feel like, like, like serving. Trusting God is when you don't feel like trusting God. You're in a bad situation, you just want to run, and you trust Him anyways. That's what defines it as the real thing. Um, anybody can, can trust God or worship when things are good. Hey, I've got no sicknesses, nothing wrong, nothing's going wrong, I have a great job, and I have a great house. Oh, well, great. <laughs> what happens when trouble hits? I've noticed that no matter who, y- who you are or where you are, you're going to have struggles in life. If you're overseas, you're going to struggle with things like, you know, suffering for your faith. If you're here on this side of the water, you're going to struggle with things like your health or different things like that. Either way, you're going to have struggles that come to you and temptations that come because of those struggles. And either way, you're going to have to choose to trust God through them. God has so ordained it that every person has to choose for themselves to trust and obey. So uh, the one thing that I always ask myself when I'm reading these passages in, in Hebrews is I always stop and ask myself, when is the last time that I learned something? When's the last time that I did something new? When's the last time that somebody said something and I actually learned something from it? If it's been longer than a week or two, you might be in danger. 
if it's been longer than a month or two, you probably are in danger. And if it's been longer than a year or two, you're really in a pickle. You need to be in a place where you are growing constantly. You need to be in a place where you have, uh, you know, a network, people you can rely on, people you can trust in, something you're learning from, okay? <laughs> it's got to be a point when, when you are moving forward. So that takes us to verse 15, and then verses 16 through 19 are all kind of toge- together. So 15 says, As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. So obviously daily choices, daily examination, you know, don't let don't let yourself get kind of complacent, and cold. You know, pay attention to where you are, pay attention to where you're going. I once heard a pastor say this. People always say to me, is what he said, "I'm in a good place," and I said, "Okay, yeah, I've said that myself." And then he said this: "It's not about where you are; it's about where you're going." The Christian walk is kind of a trajectory. What people do is they look, where am I at now? Oh, I'm in a good place still. And they don't worry until they realize that they're down here somewhere. They realize, oh, I've stopped trusting in God. I've stopped growing. I've stopped changing. I, I, I don't learn anything anymore. I, all I do is think that I know everything. Well, if you look at where am I going, you can kind of see where your trajectory is before you get it. Everybody thinks, I'm, j- I'm good here. I'm going to stay out here. Nobody is staying where they are. You are currently growing or shrinking in the faith. That's just how life works. It's always dynamic. It's always moving. So it takes us to verses 16 through 19. And these are all very very much so the same thing, just repeated uh, three different ways. So let's kind of look at that. For who heard and rebelled? Wasn't it all who came out of Egypt under Moses? And with whom was God angry for 40 years? Wasn't it though with those uh, who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? And these three verses are all very close together. And he's talking about the same three groups each time. And he, he mentions them as the people who rebelled, sinned, and disobeyed. And then you get to verse 19, and he, sa- he throws a little bit of a curveball. So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. I'll go back and mention the three things that he mentioned in the three verses rebelled, sinned, and disobeyed. And this is his conclusion from them, from their action. So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. Not because they were sinning, because of unbelief. And the whole idea that he's getting at here is he's talking about that place of reaching that hardened heart. A hardened heart is where you are choosing to no longer believe. There's not a struggle anymore. Struggle in your faith is normal. It's natural. Everybody has struggles in their faith, the doubting. It's a place of unbelief. No. And once you get to that point, we're talking about a, a, a point where you are no longer choosing to obey God. So belief, okay, belief isn't in a feeling. I feel like I believe. It's not, it's not, it's not something you have on the inside. I know that I'm a Christian. I know that I believe in God because I feel like I believe in God. No. No. Belief isn't in a feeling. It's an action. What if I say, I love my wife because I have feelings for my wife? Of course, I never show it to her, I never tell it to her, and I also fool around with other women. But I still have a feeling for my wife. So that means I love her. No, no, it's in the action. If I love her, I will show it, I'll say it. I will not cheat around. (laughs) That is love. (laughs) You can't say, oh, I have this feeling. And belief is the exact same thing. Belief is something that we all say, I I have this belief, this this firmness. No, that's having faith in your faith. That's not actual faith. Faith is shown in your action. This is what we see in Israel. They saw what God did, the plagues and all that. Then they disobeyed. But God still forgave them, moved them forward. But then when the time came to enter the promised land, they didn't believe and they didn't enter. This is what I was talking about, the accumulation of your choices. Your choices build up to something. And so when their time came, they missed it. There's sometimes when God has peace for us, God has rest for us, God has plans for us, and we missed it because the big decision was already decided by our little decisions. We just kind of got there. Another way of saying that is because of our actions we reached a place of unbelief. In which case, just as he said in verse 19, where he said, so we see that they were unable to enter because of their unbelief, not because of messing up or sinning. It was because of unbelief. They had unbelief because they were sinning, as we saw in verses 16 through 18. 
So let's wrap up a, cu- a few ideas here. Now, one thing that we see very, very clearly is that belief is a process that's either fed by obeying or it's torn apart by disobeying. Another thing we see is that when you think you're all good is when you're not. So I want to take the time for just a second. If you are a Christian who think you've got it all together, you think, I'm doing good, I'm in a good place, I'm heading in a good place, watch out. Bible tells us over and over again, pride comes before a fall. <laughs> really watch out. Uh, I, am, I am my own harshest critic. I always b- pay very close attention to all the things I do wrong as a pastor, all the things I do wrong as a Christian. I do that on a regular basis, and I do that for a reason. The reason is I, I, I'm, I'm aware of my failures so that I am not arrogant. I don't tear myself down, but I'm aware of it. This is a very good place to be in. I am aware of my failures. I do not think I am the world's best pastor. I do not think that you guys are lucky to have me. I don't feel like that. I feel like I am lucky to be a part of what God is doing. Do you still feel like you're lucky to be a part of what God is doing? Do you still feel like, yes, I can be corrected? Do you still feel like, yes, I don't have it all figured out? Well, then you're, gonna, you're in a good place. Can you admit that you are a sinner in need of grace? And you're in a good place. Does it detest you, the thought of comparing you with those sinners out there? You're not in a good place. Because you've forgotten how much grace you need on a daily basis. And that's really the, my, my, my real go-to thing that I always kind of, I, I do this as kind of like a daily thing with me. I always like to kind of see where I'm at. So anyways, I hope that that helps you. Um, so you reach a point of accepting sin, you have a hard time trusting and believing, and then you have to do it. And then you really the only way to get rid of get out of this kind of place that we're talking about, this kind of place of unbelief, is you have to do it without feeling it. You don't feel anything. You don't feel anything in your prayers, in your devotionals, in your seeking and serving. You don't feel anything, and you do it anyways. So the summary of verses twelve through nineteen, I think, could be more or less simply said, keep a watch on your lifestyle. Keep a watch. 